Good morning. morning. That was accepted. Take your Bibles and if you would please to open them to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking at the first seven verses of Matthew chapter 7. This is probably one of the most misunderstood texts in all of the New Testament. Um, I get so frustrated when I hear people quoting this text and saying, well, see, we're not supposed to judge. And Jesus says, do not judge. But he has a very specific way that he means not to judge. And hopefully I can communicate that today, because otherwise you're going to look at my sermon and say, wow, Pastor Keith was really judgmental today. <laughs> and he was. Um, and I pray that I'm judgmental according to what God has to say is the way we should be judging. Because folks, if you don't judge, you're going to get run over. Uh, In this text, a couple things I want to point out. Um, First of all, I want you to listen to all seven verses because I think it's really, really clear by the time we get to verse 6, you you realize you can't take verse 1 and stop there with your thinking. You need to incorporate the entire context. I think you need to incorporate all of Scripture. Otherwise, Jesus is contradicting himself and not speaking truth. Um, I think you have to take at least this part in context and realize you've got to stretch your understanding a little bit in order to to incorporate all that Jesus has to say here. The second thing, um, you need to understand that in the Greek language, when it said to let me take the speck out of your eye, that wasn't a little small little speck like we think of a, a little piece of dust or something. This is a substantial splinter. This is, both people in Jesus' story have problems. <laughs> Except one's just a little small splinter and one's a plank. A two by four by eight. None of you see the humor in what Jesus has to say here. Folks, what Jesus is trying to get us to realize is that we're, we all got problems in the way we look at ourselves in the world. And that's going to become really clear next week. So if you don't like this message this week, um, don't come next week. <laughs> because it's going to get downright... Uh, we're going to talk a lot about man's depravity and how we fail to see what God has to offer us with clear eyes. And that's why we struggle so much to be the Christians we, we know we should be and that God wants us to be, but we're just, we suck at it. We don't do a good job at all. But in this passage, I want you to see that this, this speck is much bigger than just a little small little speck. It's a, it's a good-sized splinter itself, but that Jesus is saying, be careful, that you, you aren't totally blinded and trying to help somebody else out. And then, second of all, when he talks about dogs and pigs, these are unbelievers. These are people who have a total disregard for the gospel. The the kind of people who get very, very angry at the Gideon spreading God's word. The type of people who get angry when any Christian proclaims what God's standards are. This is the dogs and pigs that Jesus is warning of now. And I would encourage you to determine in your own heart and mind how you understand who are dogs and pigs without some certain, at least, small part of judgment. Listen very, very carefully as Carol Jacobus comes and reads from Matthew, chapter 7, the first seven verses. Good morning. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Reading from the New Testament, Matthew 7, verses 1 through 6. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? When all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, 
they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. The reading of God's word. You may be seated. And Carol read the appropriate number of verses. I was just getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Seeing that there are seven verses. If you want to follow along in the sermon outline, it should be in your service folder. It looks like this. Um, my intended uh, agenda was to, to cruise through the first three points and then A and B in the, in the application section and then spend a lot of time on C. But I realized in the first message that isn't going to happen, so I'm going to cruise through pretty much everything except in point C, I'm just going to go ballistic. Um, <laughs> Pastor Dave was in the first service. To judge means to, according to Webster's, means to form an authoritative opinion. To decide as a judge, to determine or pronounce after inquiry and deliberation, to form an estimate, conclusion, or evaluation about anything, or the sixth definition of, according to Webster, is to judge means to think. <sighs> Folks, can I be, can I just kind of give you a clue up front where I'm headed with this message? 21st century Christians have parked their brains at the door of the sanctuary way too much. And it started back in my generation. Actually, I think it started back at the last part of my father's generation when we wrestled with issues that were beyond human comprehension. And so we had to make a decision either, either to think that God was bigger than us and had ideas that were well beyond our understanding or we had to just park our brains at the door and say, well, that's faith and I'm just going to trust it by faith. That was a deadly, fatal mistake that we made about 50, 60 years ago. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, but your mind means you've got to think. And the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is forcing us to think. I mean, he started out by saying, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. How do you reconcile those two things without a lot of tension? Supremely, divinely happy are you if you're just, just wasted. None of you has a problem with that. I wrestle with that a lot. But on the far side of wrestling with it, there's an unbelievable wisdom in it. Blessed are you when you're poor in spirit. Blessed are you when you mourn. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. All through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has asked us to stretch our thinking. And unfortunately, in 21st century Western Christianity, we can only wrestle with one concept, and that seems to be the end of it. The world and the flesh and the devil have reduced our thinking capabilities to about 10 words, and that's as many plates as we can spin, is one. When the God of the universe is asking us to spin 20 or 30 plates, because he knows we are capable, we're just too cotton-picking lazy to do it. Okay, here we go. The question to be answered is this. Why is Jesus so judgmental about judging? What is he trying to tell us? I believe the answers are these. The context of Jesus' teaching makes it clear that Jesus is not telling us to become mindless, unthinking, uncritical humans. But Jesus is telling us to stop being harder on others than you are on yourself. Let God be the standard for your judgments and judge in love and not in selfishness. Boy, has, has the world taken advantage of Christians' misunderstanding of this text? Because now, over the last 25, 30 years, the mantra of, among a lot of uh, Western uh, civilization is, don't judge. Don't, there's no right or wrong. You can't ma open your voice at all. Don't, you need to be tolerant of everybody. The problem is, the minute you tell somebody, don't judge, what have you done? Okay, listen, you're making me very, very nervous by you looking at me like this. You've just judged me by telling me I'm not to judge. You've made a judgment towards me by putting your values upon me and telling me I can't judge because you're telling me judging is wrong. You're judging me and telling me I'm judging. Don't you see this? 
And I really get upset. And that, boy, has this week been a, an avalanche of stories from pizza to showing movies to, to fitness clubs. I mean, it's crazy the number of examples God has given me this week. It's like God shooting me up with heroin and says, here, go preach. <laughs> now, I'm not a heroin user. And I've never been a heroin user, but that's the closest thing I can think of. I mean, every day I was like, do I preach on this too? People screaming at each other say, you can't, you need to be more tolerant. And I'm thinking, well, you need to be more tolerant. You're judging me. Well, you are too. Do you see what Jesus is trying to say? If we don't listen to the words of Jesus, all we're going to do is bicker about each other's values. And folks, if you haven't discovered this yet, newsflash, there are competing values. There's a lot of humor in what I just said, but apparently all of you missed it. My wife is the only one that's got it. She knows my weird sense of humor. Folks, Newsflash, there are people who want to eat your lunch. There are people who will lie to you and do all sorts of deceitful things in order to take advantage of you. And if you don't make a judgment about their intentions, about their motives, about their sincerity, about their authenticity, they will take advantage of you. Luckily, about two weeks ago, I received through the media and through news and through uh, all sorts of warnings that there were scammers who were claiming to be the IRS who would call you up and tell you you needed to pay the IRS a certain amount of money and you'd give them your account information over the phone. How many of you have heard of these warnings? I got three of those calls this week. And I was tempted to say, oh, I, I can't judge, so here's my account number just to show you how stupid I could be. If you don't judge. I know the world is telling us we are not to judge, we're not to make, but folks, there are competing value systems, there are competing ideologies, there are competing worldviews, and if you don't pay attention and feel the tension between those competing worldviews, you will be nothing but a pawn that people will move along wherever they want to move you in order to take advantage of you. And the God of the universe did not design you to have that happen. The God of the universe designed you in order for you to know God's values, to know God's ways, in order for you to have sound judgment, in order to determine who's trying to take advantage of you and who's trying to breathe life into you. And there's a vast difference between their motivations, their intentions, and the end result of listening to one voice and not another. The word for the day is judge. You need to learn to judge properly. And what Jesus is warning against is judging improperly in which all we do is bicker at each other all the time and criticize each other all the time and never get anywhere. And boy, is our culture there. If you can't see the competing values that are coming down the pike, and folks, I really believe The animosity between the competing values is getting strong enough that we may be headed towards another weird type of civil war. Because I see the strength of those values a lot like what happened back in the 1850s and 1860s. Even within the church. And the free Methodist church was born out of those, those struggles. That's another day. I want to show you this cartoon. I, Dina Gabberdale gave me this, this. This is absolutely wonderful. The lady is in the grocery store and she's having thoughts and the thought bubbles are becoming reality. They're actually being projected above her head and she doesn't know it. it. Though she did not know it, Carol began to suffer from visible thought bubbles. And she says over here, oh brother, there's that witch Helen, Cl- 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 Cladell. Um, she sure has been packing away the pounds. And Cl- she can see this, okay? And then there's her loser husband, Dan. The guy has the brains of a tire iron. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> you can judge me. 
Folks, let me give you a clue. Let me give you a really, really good word of advice. This is really happening with the God of the universe. All those thoughts that you said, oh, that was safe, that passed by and nobody noticed. Oh, no, the God of the universe noticed. How you doing? Yeah, me too. Let's take a look and see what the God of the universe and his son Jesus has to say about all this. What does Jesus tell us about judging? One, avoid unthinking, ungracious, destructive, reciprocating judgment or criticism. In other words, reciprocating judgment means whatever your standard of judgment towards others are, that's going to be used towards you. Look what Jesus has to say. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I had a class with uh, Tim Keller and he shared in this class a, a statement that I'll never forget. He said, think of it this way. That the God of the universe at the judgment day brings you before the throne of God and he looks at you and says, you know, I'm a kind and gracious judge and I want to be very, very fair to you because I realize that you couldn't memorize and, and de necessarily apply all of the scriptures and, because you were busy with other things and so I'm going to be unbelievably fair with you. I'm only going to judge you on the standards that you imposed upon other people. And here, let's play the tape recorder of your heart over the last 78, 84, 92 years of your life and find out what values you imposed in your head on other people and I'll judge you according to those values. <laughs> Folks, for most of us, it would be worse than having God himself judge him from his law because we impose upon other people standards that Jesus doesn't even impose. That's exactly what Jesus is saying we should not do. Romans 14 and 15 has huge passage of Scripture talking about how we need to be tolerant of each other in disputable matters. And churches are horrible at obeying Romans 14 and 15. In fact, the Hillsdale Area Ministerial Association cannot get any sort of unity, cannot get any sort of cohesiveness with the 110 churches that are in Hillsdale County. Only about 12 to 15 of them participate. You know why? Mainly because they ignore Romans 14 and 15 and don't understand what Jesus has to say here in Matthew 7, 1 through 6. They take their values, well, you have to be immersed in, in water or you're not really baptized. You have to drink real wine for communion or you're not really taking communion. You have to be, uh, you can't have a woman speak in a worship service or you've just violated the whole worship service. You wouldn't believe how many churches refuse to be a part of the ministerial association because I'm there. Because I have the audacity to allow a woman to come up and read scripture. You're looking at me like I'm weird. Don't judge me for this. This is not my value system. I'm serious, folks. Churches are horrible at imposing their own values. And folks, I, I have a hard time taking what it says in Corinthians and Ephesians and making it all the way applicable in every arena of life when Paul himself used female teachers. Oh, boy, I can get some stares back. We ought to move along. Avoid unthinking, ungracious, destructive, reciprocating judgment or criticism that comes from you and does not come from God. God's laws and God's rules and God's way breathes life into us. Our own agenda and our own way of thinking and our own way of doing things breeds death. And boy, we can see that in our culture right now. Number two, be alert to distorted hypocritical criticism. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own? That was David's problem when, he, when, he, when Nathan confronted him. David had committed uh, adultery, then covered it up by, by committing murder, and he had gotten this delusional idea that he could just continue on. And so when Nathan confronts him with the thing that, very thing that he had done, 
he gets very judgmental towards this guy who's uh, stolen the lamb and totally blind to his own personal violation at a much higher level. That is human nature. We are much harder on other people than we are on ourselves. Three, we must recognize and enforce discerning, discriminating, Bible-based, God-honoring, sound judgment so as not to bring reproach, disgrace on Jesus and the gospel. There are people who don't want to hear the good news. There are people who are hostile towards the gospel. There are, just ask the Gideons. There are people who don't want anything to do with the Gideons. There are people who don't want anything to do with this church. Jesus says, when you discern that about them, you need to back off. Why? Because when people mishandle the gospel and treat it poorly like that, it's a reproach upon Jesus and the gospel. And the way people handle things communicates their values. I had a a quilt that my grandmother had made. And for a long time, I forgot that my grandmother had made it and we used it to bed the dog. And then I realized about 50 shreds later (laughs) that this was a quilt that my grandmother had made. I obviously didn't value it very much. It should have been tucked away in a cedar chest or wrapped up somewhere and and kept as as an heirloom. Folks, when people do that to the gospel, you need to take measures to protect that integrity, to protect the value of it. And we as Christians have done a horrible job. Um... Do you know there's one whole book of the Bible that's dedicated to making us smart so that we can have sound judgment? Anybody know what that book of the Bible is? Proverbs. The entire book of Proverbs, it's amazing the number of times that it says it's writing these things to give you sound judgment, to know how to be discerning, to know how to be wise, to know how to, to look at things so that you're looking at it the way God looks at it instead of looking at it the way man looks at it, which is really the whole Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus setting up the contrast between these two. And if you think that that's just an Old Testament principle that not, not brought into the New Testament, I got news for you. That's a bunch of hooey. And I'm not being judgmental. I'm just being honest. The New Testament is loaded with incidences which says we need to take appropriate action if we see certain things happening among those who even call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me give you just a small taste of it. And I'm going to mean small because I'm only going to give you about a third of what I have here. And what I have here is only about a third of what is in the New Testament. 1 John 4.1 Test the spirits to see if they're from God. Romans 16.17 If anybody causes divisions... Keep away from them. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2. If there's sexual immorality among you, put him out of the fellowship. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15. Don't be yoked together with unbelievers. Galatians, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. If someone's idle, keep away from him. Do you know that was in the Bible? If someone's lazy and won't contribute, won't do anything, stay away from him. Why is is the Apostle Paul, why is Jesus, why is the New Testament giving us these warnings? Because the world is filled with that kind of spirit, and if you're not careful and discerning and making proper judgment, that spirit will infiltrate into your heart and mind, and you'll become just like the world. And you're not supposed to be just like the world. You're supposed to be like Jesus. And you've got to fight against that worldly mindset. You've got to fight against that world uh, mentality. You've got to make a judgment of where it exists and then make a judgment of how you're going to get away from it or how you're going to deal with it. Titus 1, 10 through 13. If there are rebellious people or talkers and deceivers, they must be silenced. (laughs) It would be interesting to see what the Apostle Paul says is the way to do that. 
Uh, if there's a divisive person, a person that keeps calling, causing divisions, have nothing to do with him. This is from the New Testament, folks. You must determine who are the pigs and the dogs in your life. You must make a judgment about who are the pigs and dogs in your life. are. If you're going to follow Jesus, and I can see it now in some of your faces, boy, he's really judgmental. Yes! But only as far as what Jesus tells me I'm to be judgmental. Because there are competing values and competing uh, standards in this world. And if you're going to follow Jesus, follow Jesus. Okay, conclusion. Am I ready for conclusion? I'm ready for conclusion. Why is Jesus concerned that we have a proper view on judging? A, we can't live as fulfilled, godly humans without judging. It's impossible. Because there is a presence in this world that is directly in violation and directly opposed to the God of the universe, and because that devilish force is wanting to impose his values upon you, you must be discerning. You must make judgments in order for yourself to be able to maintain your humanity. Because the devil would not like nothing more than to bring you down to the level of a worm that doesn't think about anything. That doesn't make any discernment about anything. And besides, have you watched how, how much these relativists and all these people who say that they're on no standards and all these people who say that they can't uh, be judgmental, how judgmental they are? It's unbelievable. I mean, ladies getting kicked out of health care clubs because a transvestite man slash woman comes into the restroom and he, she complains it, because it's a no judgment zone. Really? And then this whole U of M thing about showing an American sniper, where they say, oh, we can't show that. It's going to offend our Arab and, uh, and Iraqi uh, students that are here. And then Coach Hor Harbar, that, I love that guy already. I haven't even seen him coach a uh, college football game yet. But he says, our team's going to watch it. Oh, oh, well, we need to be accepting of all opinions. Okay, okay, we'll show it. They're... You know what really irks me? Is if you treat people with the values that they say they want to live by, they hate it. I'm tempted someday, when I, I've met these people, I've had discussions with them on, on buses and planes and those kind of things, and I, and I hear their conversations all the time, and I'm tempted to, to say, really, you believe that? To really enforce it and really live with it that way. Because they say there's no absolute values, there's no right or wrong. People should just be accepting of each other and allow everybody to live their own life. Okay, my life is to take your wallet and smack you in the face. And you're okay with that? They would throw a fit. They'd call 911. Wait a minute, you're judging me. You just got done telling me there's no right or wrong. And yet, when I express myself the way I want to express myself, you're telling me I'm wrong. They can't live with their values. You know why they can't? They were not designed to. The God of the universe has built within us a value system and a way of looking at the world that is consistent with reality. And anything outside of God's standard is inconsistent with reality and ultimately will fail. I learned in philosophy class that if you want to find out the, the, the true value of a particular way of looking at things, push it to the wall. Take it as far as you can imagine yourself taking it and see if it still holds up. Folks, relativism is not very far to that wall. It falls apart very, very quickly. You heard about the, the college student who wrote a, a paper on the relativism of man and the, the, there's no absolute standards and all men need to, need to live in this standard of no standards. And the, the, the professor wrote F on his paper and he was sure it was at least B work. And so he went to the professor and says, hey, I'm, I, this was a good paper. I did my work. I had my sources. And I, I, this is well written. There's no grammatical. You don't even have any grammatical errors. The professor, yeah. 
Actually, I took your paper to heart and I, I gave you an F. And the student said, what? Why was that? And the professor said, well, it's a blue cover. <laughs> well, what, what? I like red. <laughs> you can't give me an F just because it had a blue cover and you like F? You, you like uh, red covers? And the professor said, that's my standards. Folks, if you're listening to the world in this, I know I'm judging, nonsense about not having standards, you have already been sold a bill of goods by the devil himself and your life will be nothing but pain and suffering and your kids will be brats. Oh, folks, don't laugh. This was not a good point to laugh. I've seen those kids in the Walmart checkout lane. Oh, I don't want to impose my values on it. He's a terror! Oh, but he wants to be free-spirited. I'll let him be free-spirited. He's stealing the candy bars! Oh, but I'll pay for him. He's ripping you off! I pity the kindergarten teacher, the teacher that gets that kid. I too. Yeah! Here's the real kicker. The slide, the part B of slide A. Boy, I, gotta, I need to hurry. Our culture says that it is wrong to judge anything being right or wrong. We've heard that all over the place. And if you do judge and say that something is right or wrong, we, our culture, will tell you that's not right. You're wrong. Do none of you see the absolute idiocy of that statement? And yet that's what they're telling us all the time. Uh, B. Why is Jesus concerned we have a proper view of judging? People can't live with us if we have an ungodly, perverted, self-centered view of judging. If we're all the time being critical of people, if we're all the time uh, criticizing them for things that they're doing. Listen, folks, nothing takes the energy out of me. Nothing takes the motivation out of me. Nothing sucks the life out of me as someone that's always criticizing what I'm doing. I can work 80 hours a week and feel energized because I, I, I know something's getting done. But if I feel that what I'm doing is actually negative and that people are, don't like what I'm doing, I, can't, I, I, I struggle to get 10 hours in a week. You know why? Because it sucked the life out of me. People can't live with us if we have an ungodly, perverted, self-centered view of judging. I love this quote by John Stott. It's in your sermon outline. We have a fatal tendency to exaggerate the faults of others and minimize the gravity of our own. We seem to find it impossible when comparing ourselves with others to be strictly objective and impartial. On the contrary, we have a rosy view of ourselves and a jauntous view of others. Indeed, what we are often doing is seeing our own faults in others and judging them vicariously. That way, we experience the pleasure of self-righteousness without the pain of penance. See. Why is Jesus concerned that we have a proper view of judging? By loving others, being critical of ourselves and gracious to others, we usher in God's kingdom here on earth when we understand and implement God's teaching on judging. Love covers a multitude of sins. Listen, I'm going to do things that are screwed up and wrong. But if you're just stupid, don't criticize me. If it's against Scripture, you should be all over me. I know of pastors who have been run out of their churches because they wore a shirt like this. It wasn't white. Pastors must wear white. Show me anywhere in the Bible where it says pastors need to wear white shirts. I'm serious. A church of 800 people, the pastor got ran out in Burn, Indiana because his shirt... Yeah, burn Indiana because his shirt wasn't white. That is man's standards that have been imposed as being God's standards. Beware. Because when God starts judging you, you've opened Pandora's box. D. 
When we see the heart of God and understand our own hearts, we can be honest and bold enough to honestly eva evaluate our critics and our own criticisms. That's why we need to guard our hearts. My worship point is this. Worship the God of the universe whose every word speaks life into the world. That is why you need to be a student of God's word. That is why you need to make his word your standard of living. That is why the work of the Gideons is so absolutely crucial. <sighs> Gospel application. Realize your tongue reveals the status of your heart. You need the gospel to have the power to gain control over your heart. That's why we invite Jesus to come into our hearts. That's why we invite Jesus to transform our hearts. That's why we ask that the God of the universe take over our hearts. Otherwise, these stupid values, these stupid criticisms will come out. And we're just destroying ourselves and others. My spiritual challenge is this. Recognize those areas of your life where self still reigns. Allow Jesus to reign in your life. And I know for a lot of you, you can look back in your, in your life and say, yes, I invited Jesus in my into my heart 15 years ago, 8 years ago, 658 years ago, at some time in your life. And you think that's the only time you need to do it. Folks, I'm here to tell you, you need to invite Jesus in to reign in your heart and your life every minute of every day. And I'm convinced the reason why it's even more crucial today is because the world's culture is so anti-Christ. It is so against God and his principles. The very notion of not judging at all is just drives me nuts. That's not what Jesus meant. What Jesus meant by saying do not judge was mean to be critical of other people and light on yourself and using your own standard to judge other people instead of God's standard. Recognize those areas of your life where self still reigns and allow Jesus to reign in your life. I want to share a story that happened, um, I think, somewhere around 15, 15 years ago. Uh, and Chuck Colson, I, I, I'm pretty sure Chuck Colson talks about this in a, in a video series called Wide Angle. Um, I couldn't find the source. I've looked all week for the source, but I know this story exists, and it's absolutely wonderful. There was one time an evangelist who was at a church in Wisconsin, and he was uh, there for a week of revival services, and he was speaking, and as he uh, was speaking, it came up that, he was, that God was against uh, homosexuals, and it somehow got out into the street. Now, this evangelist wasn't making a big deal about it. He said God's against homosexuality just like he's against stealing, just like he's against uh, 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 taking the Lord's name in vain, just like he's against adultery, just like he's against murder, just like he's against uh, overeating and gossip. And so he wasn't making a big deal, but it got out to the gay and lesbian community and they stormed the church during one of his evening services. And they invited the news uh, casters, the news reporters to come in and shoot the whole storming of this church as they were going to undo this guy for his hateful comments. Wow. And he was preaching along when in come this whole 40, 50 gay and lesbian community and start throwing condoms at him and just totally disrupting the whole uh, evangelistic service that was going on. And he just stood there and took it. Allowed them to go on and rant and rave and make fun of him and be ridicule him and s say all sorts of hurtful things about him. They didn't even know him. And through all these things. And then they finally ran and raved enough and they left. And the news reporter asked him afterwards, says, why did you just stand there? Why didn't you take any action at all? Why did you do something against these people? He said, why would I? They're no different than a blind person who steps on my toes. They don't know what they're doing. Have we heard that before? Father, forgive them. They don't have a clue. Folks, the Christian community is going to be asked to take a stand. And we can either cave 
and allow the gospel to be run roughshod over and bring reproach upon the name of Jesus and the gospel. Or we can lovingly stand knowing they don't know any better, but knowing we know the truth and that ultimately the truth will set us free. I'm praying that the God of the universe will give me that kind of grace because it doesn't come naturally. That kind of grace only comes when the God of the universe has residence in your heart, has current residence in your heart. And we all know how quickly it can go from residence to 50 miles away. Just look at Matthew 16 and Peter if you want a snapshot of how quickly we can lose the Spirit of Christ. But I know this. As long as our culture does not have a revival, it's going to get worse. And it could very well be that somebody will take my words and allow them to be twisted around to that I'm a hateful person towards homosexuals, which is not true. In fact, this church has some from time to time. <gasps> Pastor Keith, say it's not true. It's true! Deal with it. I'm glad they're here. But if someday I'm put in prison or someday I'm stripped of my position or someday I'm accused of hate crimes, I pray that I'll have the strength to stand. Yeah, I'll take it. And when you're pressed to the wall, I pray that you'll have the strength to stand. Not in an accusatory or revengeful way, but showing the love of Christ. Knowing we're no better. All of us are desperately lost sinners. And if you don't believe that, come next week. What Jesus has to say next, I think is devastating towards anybody that think, thinks they're self-righteous. <laughs> We're all sinners who desperately need God's grace. Let's pray. God help us. We live in a culture that is violently opposed to you and your principles. But you've called us to love our enemies. God, help us to be supremely, divinely happy when we're persecuted for the sake of your son, Jesus. Help us to be supremely, divinely happy when we're persecuted for the sake of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Please stand for the benediction. Now may the God of the universe, who has not only empowered us by a great example through his son Jesus, but has empowered us through his spirit so that we might be living examples of grace and mercy and truth. May that spirit, may that word go with you now and forever and ever and ever. Amen. Thanks so much for coming. Have a great week, you all.